I will praise you, O Lord of my heart. I will tell of your wonders on earth. I'll be glad and rejoice in your life. Sing praise to your name, O Most High. Yes, Father, we thank you for your word and thank you that we can come and, and hear from you. Lord, your word is direct, your, your word is clear, your word is powerful, so help us to come in obedience and to listen and to hear what you want to tell us today. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We are in this um, series on um, living in a, in a manner worthy of the Lord. Um, the, it's a, from the book of Colossians and we've been walking a long journey now. And we're right in the, in the middle of a very controversial passage. Why this is controversial is that he is speaking into the way that certain people are doing church. And he's telling them no. And if you know people, you would know that the way that you do your church, your religion, is often very personal. And it's, it's, it's a bit painful when someone else comes and says, no, 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 don't do that. But this is how I've always done it. This is how my grandparents did it. And so, which is why it's so beautiful that we can look at the Word. And that it's not me today saying, not this, not this, but it's Paul, it's the Holy Spirit, it's God saying today, don't, don't do this or do this. Um, and so what is the controversy at the moment is that this church, this young new church in Colossae, they struggled because people was, were coming into the church, um, Judaizers, so people who still clung to the old covenant, um, with a mix of mysticism, with a mix of all these different things. And they came in and they basically said, it's all good and well that you are saved, but now you need to become a real Christian. Now you need to start doing the things that real Christians do. And um, last week we looked at the idea that it's not about rituals, but about Jesus. That under the old covenant there were food laws, there were festivals, there was Sabbath keeping. And under the new law, I mean, go read Hebrews where he speaks about the fact that when the old covenant dies, the old law dies. It doesn't mean everything that's in the old covenant is now gone. That's a very bad approach to take. But it's for you to see what is God doing in the new covenant with the law. It's often far more difficult. It's often far more demanding. But it's through the Spirit and it's through power. And so Paul is coming and telling them that geez, today's are get it wrong when they come in and they say, keep the festivals, keep the thing. And it's not necessarily the problem that you do it, you're welcome to do it. But to put a demand on people to say, you're only really close to God if you do this. That's what Paul has a problem with. If you come into people and say, I'm judging you now because you're not keeping Sabbath. Paul is saying, no, that's not what it's about. It's about Jesus. Everything, the festivals and the Sabbath and the food laws was supposed to do for you in the Old Covenant, my direct connection with Jesus through the Holy Spirit does to me in the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, I need a festival to focus on the fact that Jesus is coming again. Under the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit in me screams it out every day, yes, Jesus is coming again. I don't have to need a feast. Can I do a feast? Do a feast if you need a feast. But it's not the center. It's not the core. It's not what it's about. Um, and so... What we get into today is another group. Now, some people say it was a, a very mixed up Jewish group that came in. And you know, what's the that Jewish cults, the Kabbal and those type of things? There's already came in those times, very mysticism things that they added to the Jewish faith. Or it could have been people coming from the Gnostic and Greek side. We don't really know. But the problem was that they were saying that only real Christian is a mystic Christian. That you're only really close to God when you do these certain things. There are certain rituals and things that you must do to get close to God. So we're going to pray. We can open your Bibles along to Colossians 2. We're going to read from verse 18 to 19. And before Maureen comes and reads to us, let's just pray. Father, we are on the ground where we really need to listen closely. Because we can also hear incorrectly. These Verses can also push us too far to the other side where we hear, I don't have to do anything. That's not your point. 
Your command is Jesus. Your call to us is Jesus. Getting our life, our hope, our everything from Jesus directly. So Lord, that is my prayer for us today. Jesus, that we will know you more and more. That we will wake up in the morning longing to speak to you more than to people on WhatsApp. That we will wake up in the morning longing to read what you say in your word more than what has been written on Facebook since last night. Lord, that you become the center of our being in everything. And that's our prayer this morning in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Colossians 2 verse 18 to 19 Let no one disqualify you insisting on this. Asceticism and worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. Verse 18 there says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in details about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. Um, so the word here, do not disqualify. In verse 16 he said, Do not let them judge you. Because in verse 16 the context was Jews coming in and holding up the law and judging people for not keeping the law. Here it's not a case of law, here it's a case of people coming in and saying, based on what you do, we can't link it directly to the Bible, but based on what you do, we are disqualifying you from the inner circle. The, the term you disqualify is the idea of a, in a sport match, where the referee can come and say, you did not do everything that was done to get the prize, so you are disqualified, you missed out, let's give the prize to this group over here. Which is very Gnostic about it, that there's a group with special knowledge and the rest can just only wish they were part of it. So um, the false teachers here came in and they pushed people out for not fitting the holy mold that they saw. Now this has been repeated all throughout history. When Pentecostalism started in the 1900, it started with a guy that had a school, the Bethel School of Bible, and he decided, he said, we're going to send all the students home over um, December, and then you must all go and study for me and find out what is the sign that you have the Holy Spirit. And so when they came back, a whole bunch of them said, we think speaking in tongues is the sign of the Holy Spirit. And, and then a bunch of the students go, but no, Corinthians says it's, it's a gift given to some. And those students were worked out. You don't fit our mold. Our mold we've, we've cast our mold. Our mold is, if you don't speak in tongues, you're not part of God's people. And so those students had to leave the college. And had to leave the group. Um, so let's see what the things were that they were disqualifying people on. The first one is there's asceticism. Um, this word actually only means humility. It's the Greek word for humility. But in the context here, it refers to a very fake humility. Um, the NASB talks about self-abasement. It's the idea of when you live this life and you show the world what a peaceful and humble person you are. But it's actually this very thin layer on top of a very proud person. And you often see it when someone is cross. They change like this. But it's this idea that, that I'm, I'm a very humble person. And why can't the whole world be so humble? It's being very proud about how humble you are. Now this was very true of the Pharisees. The Pharisees love to brag about their humility. They love to brag how they are unimportant. A great example of this is in Luke 11. Where we read and says, The Pharisee standing by himself prayed, Thus God... I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. What word occurred most in his prayer? I, 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 I. Oh Lord, I thank you that I am so humble and I am so great. 
So this is the thing that he, that he wants. Now, how would this play out in our world? Where would you find asceticism in our world? Now, the Catholic Church, for a long time, um, had the whole market of this, where they enforced asceticism. You have to go live in a monastery and, and give up things and not speak and not do certain things. And it's this really enforced, look, wearing ragged clothes and that type of thing. Uh, but that's Catholics. And in our church, in our world, and, um, this plays out in very many subtle, not so subtle ways. And one of it is extreme minimalism. Look at me. I'm not like those guys who store up treasures. Look how empty my cupboards are. I only have one plate in my house. Extreme minimalism. The other one is extreme fasting. Where you, you eat basically nothing because you, you, you want to show how, how deeply broken and, 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 and humble you are. And so what we can see with a lot of these things is that in themselves, there's not a big problem. They can be done in a good way. It's a good thing to live in a minimalistic way, not so dependent on stuff, not storing up stuff. There's a good thing. It's a good thing to fast. Jesus said, when I leave, my people will fast. But you see the problem here. It became a tool to show how great I am. So they always told other people about this thing. They always, everyone always had to see and look at how humble I am. And I, I compared myself to others the whole time, like the Pharisees. Oh, I'm not like those people. Oh, and I'm not like those people. And it's a very proud thing. And so when you then go there, and you start putting pressure on other people, saying, well, you can't be close to God. Look, you have a TV. You have a car that's newer than 10 years old. You can't be close to God. Why are you storing up treasures on earth? And it's when you start becoming a tool to judge other people that you've gone too far. The next one that they speak about is the idea of the worship of angels. Now, there's two possible meanings. The text allows two possible meanings. The first one is that they actually worship angels. Um, now that obviously is very problematic. And I don't think we find it a lot in our world, but I have for instance been in an in a interdenominational prayer meeting in Stilby where the one lady said, this is a serious problem, we have to pray to this angel now because they deal with that, and then we have to pray to that angel because they deal with that. And so there is a sense among some people where your focus is on angels. Now, in our Bible study in Daniel, we looked at it about this. And there's not a single command in the Bible for you to, to initiate interaction with angels. Do you realize that? There's not once when you are called, um, called to call angels, or speak to angels, or desire angels even. Are there angels? Of course yes. Are angels used by God to do good in our world? Of course yes. But that's not our role. Our role is to speak to God and say, this is my problem, help me. And He might choose, if He wants to, to use angels as the means of helping. But nowhere are we called to, to start focusing on angels and knowing their names and calling out to them and worshipping them and praising them. The other, so that's the first one, is actual worship of angels. The second one, and we have some examples of this in the Jewish writings of that time, that it is worshipped by angels. So it's worshipped led by angels. And so this is the very proud idea that our worship is better than your worship because we have angels leading us. We don't have humans sitting in the week preparing a song and then we come on Sunday and they sing it for us. We have the, we just stand and we just sing anything that comes to our mind because angels are leading us. Um, which is also very problematic because the Bible speaks about humans leading worship. It speaks, speaks about humans doing hard work to prepare for worship. And you can go read about it in 1 Chronicles 25, for instance. But see again how this idea that angels are fantastic, spirit beings of God, used for good, but people who fall into this trap again use it as a tool to become proud. I am better than you because I have connections with angels that you don't have. That's the problem here. It becomes proud and exclusivity. The next one, going on in detail about visions. Now, I have not really 
experience much of angel worship in Stolbein, but this in Stolbein I experience often. The idea that if you don't get visions from God, there's something wrong with your Christianity. If you are not there, you can come and, and tell everyone about the new vision God gave you. Um, it's a problem. Now the King James here says it in an interesting way. It says, intruding into things he has not seen. And it makes it seem like when he's not talking about visions. So what the King James is trying to say, intruding into things he has not seen with physical eyes. That's why it's visions. That's how you must read the King James here. But um, again, it's basically people who come in and they disqualify disqual people on that you're not there yet where we are. Yes, you have your Bible, read your Bible, that's fine. We've gone to the next level now. God gives me visions to speak to me. And then you come and you share your vision and stuff. <laughs> now, the, the interesting thing is that asceticism, so this, this degrading of your body, and visions often go together. Because scientifically, it's a known fact that if you deprive yourself from what it needs, you start hallucinating. So severe fasting leads to hallucinations. Um, I don't know if you've ever read about um, um, sensory deprivation chambers where they put people in. There's a new one where it's so black, the blackest black you can paint, and they put in there. And most people, within 30 minutes, start hallucinating. One guy saw an army of ducks walking past him. Are they there? No, they're not there. Does he see them? Yes, he sees them. Because his brain can't cope with a lack of sensory, so it starts hallucinating. So do you see how it could have played out in the church? People putting their bodies through this harm, and then they get visions that's got nothing to do with God. It's hallucinations, and they bring it to the church, and they say, oh, we're so much better. Because God speaks to us in visions. Now again, we mustn't go too far. Are visions in itself bad? No. God can choose to reveal His known truth to you in a vision. God can choose to make personal the eternal truths of God to you in a vision. But again, when it becomes a tool to say, I'm better than you because I get so many visions, that's where the problem is. Okay. Um, we don't need more visions. We need more love. We need more biblical truth, we need more obedience, we need more grace. So, what he's trying to say to the Colossians in all of this is, don't let anyone make you feel like a lesser Christian because you don't do these mystical things. Remember who he's speaking to, he's not speaking to unbelievers. Earlier in Colossians he says, guys, you are born again. You are radically born again. God is working in you. He's changed you. You are on fire for him. You know him. Don't let that guy come and say, ah, you're missing visions. You're missing a Sabbath. Because you don't keep a Sabbath, you're not close to God. So as long as you know Jesus. And so then he, he says, what becomes a problem here is that they become puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. This is Jesus linked to the anyone there at the top. Um, Sensuous is the idea of a fleshly or a worldly mind. And so the great irony of this is, many people go down the path of mysticism because their intentions are good. They want to get closer to God. And, and that's the same with, for instance, the Hebrew Roots Movement and law keeping and, and Sabbaths and stuff. It starts in a very good place where you're saying, God, I look at the church and it's really troubling. It doesn't look like the church is close to you. There must be another way. And then they start very honestly, really seeking to know God down this path. But what he says is, it so often ends up that I get puffed up because I now have it. Oh, you know that church people. Oh, they're sitting there on Sunday. I have it. I know it. But that's the problem. Something, sometimes a good intention doesn't lead you on a good path. You need to listen to God. Um, so yeah, instead, what must you do instead if you desire to get close to God without falling into the trappings of the mystical movement? Paul speaks about a better way. And he says, the problem with them is that they are not holding fast to the head. So they went into this because they want to hold fast to God. But eventually they hold fast to the things. They are proud of their Sabbath keeping. 
for me, it seems that the main thing you do on Sabbath is to post on WhatsApp that you are doing Sabbath. That's what most people do. Um, they are holding on to these things, and over time, their fingers slip from God. And it's not about God anymore. It's about the things. It's about my fasting. It's about my silence. It's about my being alone. Um, so the problem is not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joint and ligaments grows with the growth that is from God. So there's a better way to get closer to God. A better way than the Hebrew Roots movement. The better way than the mystic movement. And that is the way where you hold fast to Jesus. You hold fast. And the text says a couple of things. It says you must hold fast to Him as the head. So the road to deeper spirituality is me coming to Jesus and saying, you are in charge. I'll listen to you. I want to come and know you. I want everything to submit to you as the head. I'm not the head. I'm not the boss. I'm not the brains in this relationship. You are and submit to you. Um, and so that is what true worship is. True worship never leads you to feel puffed up. True worship never leads you to a thing like, oh, I'm so better than the guy next to me. True worship always gets you to your knees where you say, Jesus, how on earth do you love someone like me? How on earth could you die for me? How? And you become so small in your understanding of yourself, and your understanding of God becomes so big, because He's the head and I'm not. And the next thing that you must see here, why is He suddenly switching the metaphor here, and He's starting to talk as a body? He's not saying, you... Go sit over there, hold fast to God. He says, as a body, hold fast to God. Now, it's good to be alone. It's good to be able to sit alone with God and speak to Him. But the mystic movement is geared to solitude. Getting you away from other people. Walking this journey alone. Don't worry about the people around you. Just focus on you, you and God, you and God. God says, I do my work through the church. I do my work through the body. We say this often. If you're a Christian who's not connected to a church, you're lacking. Because there's no person on earth that God gives all the gifts to. You can benefit from all the gifts, but you benefit through other people who have those gifts. So if you're off on your own alone, you don't have everything that you can have in Christ. You'll always be a Christian lacking. So the idea, the emphasis here is community. And so then the text says, if you start doing this as a body, as an individual, holding fast to Jesus, then he starts nourishing you. So he feeds you. You don't get your, your growth from these other visions, and he is the one feeding you. He knit you together. You're still wondering about this idea of, a, of why church, why body? That's his goal. That's how he grows your maturity, by knitting you into a community. And that's how he grow, gives you growth. Um, not by something I do. That growth is from God. That's often the thing about the mysticism. The more I do, the more I will get closer to God. True faith is the more I submit, the closer I get to God. The more I make it about Jesus, the more I grow, and the closer I get to Him. Now let's get practical. Because it would be very bad if I say Hold fast to Jesus, now go home. How, how do I hold fast to Jesus? How in a world where Israelites are killed in the street and in their homes, do I hold fast to Jesus? How in a world where Sonia and Son dies in a motor crash, do they go and say, I want to hold fast to Jesus? How in a world where everything that you are dealing with and all these things are so overwhelming and so heavy, and you think, how can I get closer to Jesus? I want to hold on to Jesus, but it feels so hard. How do I do it? Well, the first thing we've already mentioned, belong to a job, to a church, a body. This is where God feeds. This is where God loves. Sonia and Ian's testimony yesterday was, thank you, church, for being there for us. Thank you that we didn't have to walk this road alone. Um, and there's a, there's a biblical term for a Christian that doesn't belong to a church. Did you know? It's 
called the disobedient Christian. Below. Not, not because it's the easiest and most fun thing to do, but because it's the most needed thing to do. It's what we need. It's where we belong. Um, yes, spend time alone with God, please, but also make time for community. Proverbs 18 verse 1 says, Whoever isolates himself, seeks his own desire, he breaks out against all sound judgment. Whoever isolates himself, seeks his own desire, he breaks out against all sound judgment. And so practically, how do I hold to Jesus? Not by just being a name on the church list, but by being involved, by joining a community group so people can know me, by a Bible study, and by joining in service, in ministry, by being here, by drinking tea and chatting to someone I've never spoken about to. Um, that's idea. The, the second idea of holding fast to Jesus is just to understand that that is a very brief description of what the Christian life should be. It's about the moment I'm saved, I live absolutely in dependence on Jesus. Every day I need it. Some people want it differently. They want to come and say, okay, Jesus, heal me, um, make me new, forgive my sins, give me power, give me gifts, give me the fruit of the Spirit so I'm a nicer person. Thanks, I'll see you in eternity. And now I can live my life because I've got all these things and I don't need you. But that's not how God wants it to be. He wants us to live dependently. Now imagine your body tells that to your brain. Thank you for all those signals all throughout the years of how to move. Um, it's very nice and we appreciated it and I think we have everything now. Okay, so here we're going to leave you over here now and body, we're just going to carry on and we'll see you one day again. Um, I was wondering if I should tell this illustration because it's quite gruesome but the kids aren't there. They say that if you chop off your head cleanly, your head can still carry on for 30 seconds max. That's a scary notion. But the body is useless. The body is useless. Um, you cannot live without the head. You can't, there's not a day you can live without Jesus. So holding fast to the head is waking up every morning and this understanding that Jesus, I need you. So you better speak to Jesus right there and say, Jesus, I'm going to need you today. It's about every decision I make in the day saying, Jesus, what should I do? It's about every action that I do saying, Jesus, is this the thing you want me to do? That's what it means to hold fast to Jesus. That I don't run to other things that I think will get me to Jesus, but that I deal with Jesus and speak to Him and cling to Him. So in conclusion, um, we need to remind ourselves, because you can enjoy this sermon for the wrong reasons. You can enjoy the sermon for the idea of like, oh, thank goodness, you know, there are all these people who are forever telling me how I need to live as a Christian. It's so good that you told me that no one needs to tell me how to live and I only need to listen to Jesus. That's not at all what we are saying. We are talking to people who listen to Jesus and not the extra things, not the other things. The other things are the trappings. Obedience to God is still a thing. I mean, go read the rest of Colossians. Read what's coming in Colossians. So the, the lesson for today is not, do not let anyone disqualify you because they tell you what to do. In church we need to tell each other what to do when we forget. When we don't see God's word clearly. We need to bring God's word to each other and say, remember this is what Jesus says. Hold fast to it. Listen to it. But also, um, do not let anyone Make you feel like a lesser Christian because you're not involved in all these visions and all these other things. You need Jesus. That's what you need. Um, and so what I want to do now is I want to pray for people who feel like they have slipped away from clinging to Jesus. Where it's become about other things. It's become either worldly things or or mystical things, or laws, or things that, that became about those things. And it's no longer about You don't talk to Jesus anymore. You just talk about Jesus. You don't, you don't listen to Jesus anymore. You just make sure you're following all the rules. All the, the prescriptions. So you don't have to put up your hand. But in your heart you can put up your hand if you want me to pray for you as well. That we get back to clinging to Jesus as an individual and as a community. Let's pray to
Well, that's sobering to remember that so many false paths start with good intentions. So many roads that lead away from you promise to lead us closer to you. And so Lord, we pray today that you will help us to know you. To know when something is a distraction. To know when someone's demand of us is not a biblical godly demand. And someone's um, puffing themselves up with other things that we will just keep on walking. Keep on clinging to Jesus. Thank you for the gift of church. Thank you that you're here. You say here, as a church, we need to cling to you. That you do your growth and your work and your nourishment into this body. And Lord, help us to not just be a name, but that we belong. That we reach out. That we care. That we listen. That we speak into the lives of those who love us and we love that we can also cling to you. Lord, I want to pray for those who have been slipping away. Those who remember times when they were close to you. The times when they woke up in the morning, they couldn't wait speaking to you. Those times when they had off times and they just wanted to read their Bible. Lord, I want to pray that we get back to it. Back to clinging to you. Back to the, the very basic relationship of Hearing from you through the Word and the Spirit and speaking to you through prayer. Just that. Getting back to you. Lord, help us because in our own strength we will run away to other things. We are so easily distracted. We are so easily confused. We are so easily enthralled by other things. So Holy Spirit, bring us back to the center. Bring us back to Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I will praise you, O Lord of my heart I will tell of your wonders on earth I'll be glad and rejoice in your life Sing praise to your name, O Most High